You're watching Grassroots Community TV, the nation's original community-operated television station, protecting and nurturing open channels of communication for the citizens of the Roaring Fork Valley since 1972. Hi, DJ. Hey, Georgia. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. I'm Georgia Hansen, the CEO of the Aspen Historical Society, but more importantly, a wonderful close friend of Tom Benton's. That matters to me as much as almost anything else. Uh, he, he married me the first time I got married. And I'm going to tell you my favorite Tom Benton story, which is many, many years later when Tom and Marcy were going to a wedding in Texas. And uh, t Tom discovered that he was on the George Bush freeway and he wouldn't r drive on the George Bush freeway. <laughs> <laughs> So he got off and he started taking side roads and they missed the wedding. If that isn't classic Tom Benton. <laughs> we're lucky that DJ adopted Tom and came up with this wonderful collection and I hope I'm looking forward tonight. We want to thank John and Jackie Buxbaum because they're the ones who sponsored this event. They would be here in a heartbeat if they could, but they couldn't be here because their jet isn't landing until 8 o'clock. So let's thank them for sponsoring In Absentia. And um, John grew up here hanging out in this building, is my understanding, in the summers. Uh, and I'm just going to now turn it over to Mr. Watkins. Thank you, Georgia. Oh, no, you're all right. <clears throat> That's right. Uh, John Buxbaum actually had a really great story about Tom Benton and that his parents uh, gave him $5 when he was about eight years old to uh, buy a birthday present. And he came into this gallery and Tom went through the process of showing him how the silk screens were made. And uh, he picked out his favorite one, which is the Aspen skier print. And uh, um, that print is still with him to this day. So. Um, with that, I just want to welcome everyone to the Second Liberty Salon. I want to thank the Aspen Historical Society for hosting this event. Uh, we got a very special person in the house tonight, um, Joe Edwards, um, another close friend of Tom's. He's going to come and talk about Tom Benton, Aspen, and uh, his memories of this place. Um, as you see, we've got some posters that we put up from that era. Uh, we've got a Bill Noonan poster from 1970. A Joe Edwards poster from 1972, and I'm sure Joe will tell a funny story about this poster. Uh, Ned Vare, a contemporary, uh, as well as Hunter Thompson. Um, Joe had a, a very interesting history in this town. Uh, he ran for mayor in 1969 uh, with Hunter as his de facto campaign manager and lost by six votes, um, inspired Hunter to run for sheriff, and then Later on, uh, returned in 1972 to win a county commissioner seat with Dwight Shellman. And then they instituted a lot of the land reforms and a lot of the reforms that made Aspen the way it is today. And um, uh, he's going to talk about those changes and sort of the consequences, unintended consequences, um, as well as uh, uh, you know, his fond memories of Tom in this building. And, um, I want to thank him for coming in, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Joe Edwards. Thanks, Thanks for coming, Joe. <laughs> yeah, you can sit in the other one. Oh, that's uh, fine. You're fine. You can stand, too. Okay. Um, I hope my voice will carry to the back of the room as I get older. It seems to get weaker. But um, 
reflecting on this building, if you want to see what it looked like when Tom was here, go in the bathroom. That's the only room they didn't screw up with this stupid paint. <laughs> but the whole thing used to, it, it had a very Japanese look to it. Uh, it was all natural wood and uh, infused with smoke. And, you know, we have a lot of, I have a lot of fond memories of being here with, with Hunter and Tom. We uh, spent many a night here uh, trying to figure out what we were going to do next in the, in the battles that were going on back in the late 60s and the early 70s. Let me uh, back up a little bit and kind of create a context for what happened. Uh, and, and, and I'll start by describing the town as it existed in, when I first came here in 1959, um, it was no, there were no paved streets except for the highway. There were no condominiums. Everyone lived in uh, a miner's shack with newspaper for insulation, or they lived in uh, these converted Victorians. And it was, uh, it was an unusual set, setting in, in that it seemed to me when I first came here that everybody that came, that I saw was extremely happy. Uh, I just remember the scene over by uh, where the mountain now, you know, the ski hill. And it, it may have been because I was young, I was 19, 20 at the time, <laughs> But uh, there were two girls got into a World War II Army Jeep, and their German Shepherd jumped in behind them. And, and they both had long blonde hair and tight blue jeans. And I thought, man, this is a town that I could get <laughs> attracted to. And everybody seemed happy, and everybody seemed like about 25. And I know there weren't. There were people who had been here their whole lives. Uh, but but the town population, and this was this was a time when uh, the nation was a little bit crazy. The Vietnam War was going on. The anti-war rallies were going on. The the riots uh, of the uh, the blacks were rioting, and and the the whole country seemed to be having a war with itself. And Aspen just seemed to be. It, it was hard to get here. It was a five-hour drive over two mountain passes on a two-lane road from Denver, or a very bumpy ride on a World War II DC-3 that took over an hour. So you had to be kind of determined to be a visitor here or to live here. And you came in through nothing but ranches. Vail wasn't there. Uh, Glenwood was a sleepy little town with the hot springs and ranches all the way up the valley on a two-lane road that was built on an old railroad embankment, uh, a railroad right-of-way. So it was very isolated. It was in, there, there was not anything outside of the town between Glenwood and here except ranches. And the, the whole town seemed to be made up of you know, it was so different than it is today. It was uh, mostly young, educated dropouts who for one reason or another had decided they didn't want to pursue the corporate rat race. And uh, you could have intelligent conversations in a town of less than 2,000 people. There aren't a lot of towns that you can have an intelligent conversation with the occupants of that have uh, that little population. Mostly it's about grass and cows. But here, uh, vibrant, alive, exciting. The, in the shops, you had potters who were throwing pots right there and then selling their pottery. You had jewelers. Uh, 
making silver jewelry right on the mall, what's now the mall, uh, and selling it there in the store as they made it. You had uh, a couple of girls from Canada, I can't think of the name of the store now, but they had their coolest clothes. They made them all themselves right there and sold them. And that's the kind of, of business activity that was in town. And, you know, I, I, I just, uh, I, ha I kept coming back and finally moved here in early 1967. And um, the beginning of some problems was surfacing at that time. Uh, Snowmass had not been built. It was still ranches. And, but things were starting to happen. And it was, uh, you know, the prior mayor, Bugsy Barnard and, and Shady Lane, used to go out and some of the lodges were trying to put up billboards between Glenwood and here. And they would go out at midnight with their chainsaws and cut them down. And there was a, a feeling that the, uh, the people here didn't really want it to grow. And, and it, it was a, an enclave of sanity in a nation that was in turmoil. And there were, no, there were no fences here between people. There was no black white fence because there were no blacks. There was no, <laughs> there was no rich poor fence because there were no rich people. Uh, it was a very egalitarian society where everyone felt um, that they were with people like themselves. And, and it was, there, I don't know, it was just so comfortable. I don't know how to, how to explain that. But um, the things that started happening, <clears throat> there, there was concern, you know, Haight-Ashbury was having drug problems and it was breaking up. The hippies were spreading back across the country, and quite a few came here. The business uh, Aspen Chamber got up a petition to the Aspen Council asking them to strictly enforce the vagrancy laws and discourage undesirable transients. What that means is they wanted to run the hippies out of town. And I had uh, just gotten my law license about a month before and two of the physicists from the Aspen Physics Institute came into my office and said, are you aware of what's going on in the municipal court? And I hadn't been following it. I was just trying to get my desk set up. Mm -hmm. I went over there and watched and Guido Meyer was a, a Swiss immigrant to Aspen who came here after the war and he was uh, running it very much like I think they probably ran the trials over there in Germany. And um, they brought this little kid in, I remember. He turned out to be 15 at the time, but they didn't know that. And he had on just blue jeans, no shirt, no shoes. And they, uh, Guido said, this was the whole trial. Guido said, you dirty hippies are ruining our business and we're gonna run you out of town. 90 days, bam for hitchhiking. He'd been in town 10 minutes. He'd hitchhiked in over Independence and he was going out to Haight-Ashbury. He was hitchhiking out by the Forest Service. So that was uh, the kind of, they had six hippies in jail for three months each for doing nothing. And uh, I'd just gotten out of law school with all these high ideals about constitutional law. And so I wound up filing a civil rights lawsuit against the city, the police department, the city council and the mayor and, and the magistrate for discriminating in the way they were enforcing the laws. Because if you had short hair, you could hitchhike all day. If you had long hair, you couldn't. Or you'd be thrown in jail for three months. So that, uh, sort of got a little notoriety that way. I became the hippie lawyer. My dad said, <laughs> my dad said, don't do that. You'll never have any business clients. He was right. 
And, uh, but at any rate, a as a result of that, the police chief was fired, the magistrate was removed, and at the f following election, which I'll tell you about in a minute, uh, the council turned over. The majority of council became a progressive liberal instead of pro-business conservative. And, uh, and the whole attitude began to change. The policing, one of the things that precipitated that, that lawsuit was uh, a guy named Hal McGill, and there's a spread, there was a two-page spread in the centerfold of the Aspen Times of the police arresting him for vagrancy. It turns out he wasn't a vagrant, he was a trust funder, but he looked like a hippie. He had the round glasses and the long hair and the clothes, and his wife did too. He just dressed that way. But he was the principal plaintiff in our lawsuit on the, in Denver. I was sitting at the council table all by myself and there were six lawyers for the city. And if I made a mistake, the judge just said, Joe, uh, Mr. Edwards, would you maybe ask the question this way? And uh, when the city lawyers made a mistake, his dragon fire would come out of <laughs> Judge Araj's mouth and they would, they would melt at their council table over there. So he babied me through that. And the result was that he ultimately found that there wasn't a need for an injunction, uh, which is what we were asking for in that hearing, and, and therefore he denied it because courts only can grant injunctions if there's an immediate irreparable harm about to happen. And the city council admitted they were wrong, uh, admitted Guido Meyer was not running the court proper, properly, and uh, apologized and said they would never do it again. So they didn't need to be enjoined. So on the one hand, you could say we lost because we didn't get the injunction, but on the other hand, we won because all the changes we, the injunction would have provided and what we were asking for uh, had, had been voluntarily uh, taken up by the city. So that uh, is probably, and then, and then another thing that was going on at the same time, there was very heavy-handed policing that had become an issue in the town. Uh, there were incidences where the jail was set on fire in, in confrontations with inmates. There were incidents of uh, handcuffed prisoners being kicked and beaten by the sheriff's deputies. Uh, there were uh, all the abuses of the hippies that had been going on. And there were a progressive group of of sort of liberal intellectuals who were in town who started meeting to see what they could do about the direction that the city had been taking. And that was uh, uh, Robin Molney, an architect, Bob Lewis, uh, uh, Jim Salter, a, 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 a writer, uh, let's see, who, oh, Dr. Harvey, uh, Fritz Benedict, and they, they asked Dwight Shellman, who was uh, uh, the lawyer who recently died, who was my fellow county commissioner during the 70s, and um, they asked him to help them organize the community. And so what they did was they set up meetings in the different precincts around town uh, every Thursday night for about three months to decide what direction uh, each little caucus group in each of those precincts wanted to do uh, for the town. What do we want to, because there's these issues about heavy-handed policing, there were issues about growth that was going on. Uh, Bugsy, in one of his acts of mayor, before, he was the mayor before I ran, had tried to stop Aspen Square. Aspen Square had come in, bought, that was a lot where you parked to go skiing at the at Little Nil before, and he had he had denied a building permit to Aspen Square on the grounds that the sewer plant couldn't handle it, which it couldn't. But there wasn't anything in the code that says you can deny a permit if you're going to overflow <coughs> the sewer plant. So the the contractors' association sued the city for 
that denial won, and they had to issue the permit. And so for a while, the Roaring Fork was receiving excess sewage. But uh, there were issues about that because when North and Nail and Aspen Square went up in the first, the same summer, it really changed the character of downtown. It was, uh, before that, you'd walk around and you'd look up and Little Nell in the summertime was wildflowers. You'd walk up there and have your, your, your lunch and sit there and look back on the town. Or you could ski right down into town and go to the Red Onion or the pub because uh, the streets were dirt and uh, they didn't plow them. They just let them pack down and you could ski right into town. And so it, it had this open feeling of access to the mountain that you just kind of experienced as you walked around town. And suddenly these two lot lined, a lot lined, three-story high buildings went up that that's obscured and, and blocked that view and really destroyed that kind of uh, integration with the experience of I'm right at the base of a mountain. And so there was, uh, there were growth issues. And, and out of that uh, community organization done by that group I, w I named, they came up with a platform called the uh, Citizens for Community Action. I've got a copy of it if anyone wants to see it later. But it was all of the things that subsequently got accomplished. It was they wanted us to have open space. They wanted us to have employee housing. They wanted to have uh, equal and, and just enforcement of the laws. They wanted to stop the heavy-handed policing. Uh, they wanted to have uh, a planner. There was no planning office at that time. Um, they wanted to have, uh, you know, at the time the schools were over on that side of Main Street. They wanted to have some way for the kids to get over there. So, you know, they, they came up with this plan and then they asked anybody who was interested in running for the city council and the mayor to endorse that or not. And since I'd been participating in the process, I, of course, endorsed it. And the, and the way I got involved in that to run for mayor was Hunter Thompson, who I didn't know at all, called me about 4 a.m. one morning <laughs> and woke me up, obviously. I, he works at night. I work during the day and started haranguing me about I should run for mayor because I had this uh, symbiotic relation with the younger people in town, the ski bums, the bartenders, uh, you know, the working young kids. And uh, because of the hippie trial, I had some notoriety. Um, and I agreed to meet him the, the next night at the Wheeler, they were showing the Battle of Algiers, which is a documentary or a kind of a docudrama about, about the French oppression of the Algerians when they were seeking freedom and the tortures they were doing, things like that, which had a, you know, similar to what was going on over in the jail, although much more violent and exaggerated than what was happening here. But at any rate, uh, we met and uh, talked, and finally I agreed to do that. And I endorsed it. And meanwhile, Eve Homeyer, who was uh, the Republican candidate, later changed to a Democrat, uh, she also endorsed it. And, and the, uh, you know, the next job was to get all those younger people who had never voted, never registered to vote, to get them to, to sign up. And so, you know, there were many meetings here in this building which, uh, which Tom had built with his own hands. Um, and, and I, you know, it was Tom and I and Hunter were sort of this little nucleus and uh, planning out the strategy. And a lot of people came and helped. And I think of big Brad Reed, the potter, and uh, Pierre Landry, who went down to New Mexico. He's, he was a ski patrolman. And, and uh, oh, who was that other guy? Phil, Phil, the guy that was on the radio all the time. Uh, anyway, they went to all the bars with registration sheets and registered the younger members of the community who had never participated in politics, who had never voted for anything. 
and uh, talked them into one-on-one -on -one, uh, registering to vote. We then had a problem with, you know, the old guard who had kind of been in power for a while, felt threatened, and there were some consultations where Bugsy Barnard was threatening to beat up any hippie who came to vote who wasn't legitimate, you know, hadn't lived in Colorado for 30 days was the only uh, requirement for being a voter in the state. And uh, so, so they organized, and, and Benton was in charge of Precinct 1, which was the tough one where Bugsy Barnard was. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, they actually like had tape recorders, video recorders, mm -hmm. and were, they went to each of the voting uh, places to make a record of any harassment that, the, that Bugsy and his people in the old guard might have done against any of these younger voters who had never voted before and were a little bit intimidated by the threats that had been being circulated. And uh, there was only one incident, and Benton's, who was, who was short, he, I, I mean, I don't know what he was, 5'8 or something, but he wasn't a big man. Hunter was a big guy, but Tom was, was rough. But Tom confronted Bugsy, who was a big, intimidating, nasty-tempered guy, and, uh, and faced him down and uh, got Bugsy to calm down, and Bugsy got so mad he, he left in a huff. Uh, yeah. because he was being recorded and, and intimidated uh, himself. That, that, uh, that uh, encounter is talked about by Hunter in Hunter's first article for the Rolling Stone, Freak Power in the Rockies, which uh, centers on Joe's campaign for mayor. I just wanted to throw yeah. that out there. Yeah, that, that, yeah it's a year or so later, Hunter wrote the first article that he ever published in the Rolling Stone, he published later a lot of articles, but the first one was called Freak Power in the Rockies, The Battle of Aspen, which was really the story kind of step by step. It's almost a how to take over, <laughs> um, step by step of what we did. Uh, it, it really wasn't, I don't think, I mean, his later writings got completely wild and crazy, Gonzo, he called it, uh, where he would take some incident and turn up the dial and exaggerate it about 100 fifty percent or something. But the freak power in the Rockies is very factual. So if you want to know what happened there in 1960, was it nine? 69, it was nine, yeah. wasn't it? Yep. He, um, yep. You know, get, get the great shark hunt and it's in paperback and it's one of the stories in that compendium uh, of Hunter. Hunter said, how do you throw the pigs off the ship without sinking the ship? <laughs> it, you know, he, he said, I, what, did, what did he call me, a slow eyed or sneaky son of a bitch or something? I thought it was a, a hippie biker lawyer who almost took over the town. It, it, was, it was that, and then when, when he mm -hmm. first met, he, was, mm -hmm. he, he describes it in the story. We, mm -hmm. I didn't know what he looked like, he didn't know what I looked like, mm -hmm. so we were outside the Wheeler at the end of the movie, sort of walking around looking at who might, I'm looking at who might Hunter Thompson be and who might, what might he might look like, and he was, he was, and he said something about, could that scurvy little slow-eyed guy over there be possibly be me? <laughs> you know, so, some kind of comment like that. It's kind of funny. Anyway. And, and uh, can you talk a little bit about the Meat Possum Press? Well, the Meat Possum Press was the uh, corporate, uh, I formed that corporation in Colorado. Uh, to publish the wall posters, which are up on the wall here. And uh, it, w their idea was that uh, Hunter would write the text on the back and, and Tom Benton would create a poster on the front and they would sell them. And they were a big success. They sold out every edition that came out. And Hunter has some great stories in there. I mean, talking about the, the, the growth control issues, I think it's the third one where the sheep yeah. are. It, it, yeah, it says, how Aspen plans to grow gracefully on a diet of sewer water and wildcat stew, which yeah. is the wildcat development. Yeah, thir and, they plan to have 30,000 people in seven-story buildings at Wildcat. And, and we, you know, we turned that 
development application down. But uh, in that, there's a story in the middle about Ron Timroth, who had, you know, what happened is you had this idyllic little community of dropouts that I described, and we were all happy, wanted to keep it just like it was. And into that mix came people from Chicago and California with the ideas that we're going to make big condominiums and we're going to develop this thing and make a zillion bucks uh, off of this little cool isolated community. And one of the ideas was Ron Timroth, he was going to create Holland Hills, which is just uh, east of Basalt. And he had designed seven little windmills from Holland with the little propellers on the front and, and streams that were going to flow through the subdivision. And, and Hunter describes the night somebody put 30 sticks of dynamite in it and blew it up. <laughs> and he talks about the fact that the, the, the investigation was complicated by the fact there were too many suspects <laughs> because everyone had threatened to blow that up. <laughs> And further complicated by the fact someone had distributed 500 tabs of mescaline the night before, and half the suspects couldn't remember where they were at that hour. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was quite an interesting undertaking. And we used to have the, um, the, the annual meetings of the Meat Possum Press Board of Directors right upstairs here. Once a year, we would get together, and Betty, Tom's wife, would fix a great dinner, and certain other things would be distributed, and and we would uh, fire the company flare gun down the alley, which was <laughs> the sole company asset was a World War II 37 millimeter uh, flare gun that came out of a, a bomber. They used to bayonet lug into the roof and if the plane was going down the pilot would reach up and pull the trigger and fire the flare and uh, but we you know we had a lot of fun with this because we were young we were naive we didn't know how much trouble it was we and and aspen was a you know the the sheriff was arresting kids for smoking dope there was a lot of dope smoking going on in those days. And, uh, you know, there was a real tension and conflict from that. And one of the results of, of the transition of the police department was that, well, well let, me, let me tell that part of it later because out of out of my out of my election, which was or my run for share, run for mayor, which was which was fun. I mean, we were, you know, at first we didn't think we had a chance to win, and then as it got closer, it looked like maybe we did. And uh, actually, what happened is the then county clerk Peggy Micklick uh, deliberately did not send out the absentee ballots within 10 days prior to the election. She waited till about five days prior to the election. And in the off season, a lot of the younger bartenders, ski bums, the younger group, went down to Mexico to go surfing. So they're not here. Or they, you know, took off. And there wasn't a lot of people here in the first of November. So if you counted the absentee ballots that came in late within the time that she had delayed sending it out, uh, I actually won by 16 votes. And we thought about challenging that election, but decided that it really wasn't worth the effort. And uh, the council that got elected, four of the seven, were people who had endorsed this uh, Citizens for Community Action Action Plan. So we knew things were going to change. And Hunter kind of, Hunter was getting uh, more energized. He, he really had fun with, uh, with that sheriff's uh, thing. And he decided to run for sheriff. And he, he really had no conception he'd be anywhere close to winning. 
He just wanted to move the conversation. And the, and the police departments that we had had at that time were, um, they dressed like military, you know, flags on the shoulders and real uh, stern bearings, lots of guns and pepper sprays and things like that. And they, as I said, were abusing prisoners. So Hunter decided to run on a platform that included ripping up the asphalt and sodding the streets <laughs> and pillaring the dealers of bad drugs. <laughs> and uh, Renaming Aspen Fat City. Yeah, he wanted to rename Aspen Fat City because they were trying to uh, discourage this development craze, which was going nuts. I mean, let me drop back to Freddie Fisher back in the late 50s, early 60s. He showed his disdain for this go-go growth thing by walking in the Winter Skull Parade, which was a parade cooked up by the Aspen Chamber to try to drum up business. And his float, he was pulling behind him, was a toilet float. That's a kind of crazy, and I, I remember can, can you talk Shady. About, can you talk about Tom? Tom and his role in all this? Well, Tom was in the middle of it. I mean, he, Tom was the artist producing the posters. He had never produced political posters before, and the first one I think he ever he did. did. For you. It was for you. It said, was for me. It says, yeah. it says, save Aspen or sell it. There's still time. Joe Edwards for mayor. Yeah, and it, and the, and it had that peace fist up there, the red hand like this. That was the first political poster Tom ever did. And, and then, uh, then he did these two in 1970. Right. Uh, uh, for Ned Vare. Yeah. And, Le and Bill Noonan. I right. guess this might have been 72. This, this was when Hunter ran for sheriff, yep. which so was 70. 70. And so those two. And then. Those three are the mm -hmm. ones he did. In 1970. And then this one was created for Joe's campaign for county commissioner in 72. Right. Mm -hmm. And Tom is a fabulous artist, as you can see. I love his stuff. And uh, Ned Ver was a really, in, you know, he was really a cool guy. He, he won city, on the city council and, uh, and then was running for, at, at the election I was talking about where I ran for mayor and Eve Her Homer won by six votes, he was elected to city council and he became the leading uh, guy on city council to really change the city's policy and direction at that time. And then he ran for commissioner when Hunter ran for sheriff. And Ned Ver, who was another guy who would hang out around here. I mean, this was, this was the campaign headquarters for all those conspiracies, this building we're in right now. And uh, uh, he ran a, uh, he was a nice guy. For coroner. Yeah, he ran for coroner. He, he operated a, an antique store in the corner the of the Hotel Jerome. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I thought that was a great poster. There's also a really fascinating story about this poster. The quote on it for Joe's campaign, it says, we who are here have the right to, to say save. what kind of place it shall be. We must save the valley. And Tom would create 100 silkscreen prints for any candidate that he felt was worthy of his support. And uh, each candidate, Tom would make about 100 posters, and then he would donate the posters to the campaign to promote the candidacy. And so. Uh, for Joe's campaign, he, uh, can you tell that story real quick? Well, the, the, the quote was because a lot of people, I'm saying, look, we got to stop development. We got to slow this thing down. It's getting crazy. It's changing the way our community is going to be. We're going to, you know, and if we hadn't done that, it would look like Vail today, Beaver Creek. But we did do that. But at any rate, people were saying, you can't shut the gate after you've gotten in. And I said, the hell we can't. You know, we are here and we got the right to set up the zoning laws and say what kind of a place we want to have here. And so that was refuting that. And right down below here on the first five copies, I didn't know it, uh, Tom had printed Fuck the Rich. <laughs> and so he was late, as we all were, uh, in doing almost everything. So. 
uh, people had been asking that had the various shops that were supporting my campaign, when are you going to get the poster? When are you going to give it to me? And uh, so I opened the roll up. They came in a big roll. And the first one said, and I knew that was Tom. Tom was uh, a, a real, he was like a little elf or something. He was, <laughs> he was always making jokes and making things funny and doing little tricks. And he had a little twinkle in his eye. And he was always trying to get you to laugh. And you did. He was a very funny guy. And, and so I knew, ah, oh, Tom's just fooling with me. He just did this to freak me out, which it did. And then I looked at the second one, and it's the third one, and the fourth one, and the fifth one. I said, oh, we can't use these. <laughs> but there were only five. <laughs> so we did, there we did 90, use them. 95 without them. There were 95 the without them. <laughs> uh -huh. But, uh, you know, what he was talking about was these guys, these developers, like the guy that did Aspen Square, they come in from Chicago. They do not care about the impacts that their development has on the town. They don't care that it overflows the sewer plant. They don't care that it costs money to, you know, increase the number of buses to pick the kids up for school. They don't care. Uh, they just want to come in here and make a profit and leave, and leave whatever impacts there might be from their development for the rest of the people to deal with. And so we were feeling besieged by wealthy developers coming in here who didn't care about the community, who weren't resident here, hadn't been part of the experience here, just trying to make a profit off of the place. And uh, Hunter called them greed heads and land rapers. And other things, scum suckers, all sorts of words. Anyway, uh, Tom, Tom, you know, this was, as I said, uh, the central meeting place for this conspiracy of trying to change the direction of the town. And, and all we were trying to do was hold on to this lifestyle that we found so uh, wonderful. And, and, you know, Hunter, Hunter's, Hunter's campaign really put the nail in the coffin to the abusive policing because he... Uh, he did move the conversation way, way over. And, uh, you know, the, the whole attitude ultimately was changed in, in, this, in this area. And, and the, the, although he lost the election, he actually won in the city, to everyone's surprise. I mean, I still have this memory of the Jerome Hotel the night of his election. The BBC was here with the film crew. A couple of the networks had film crews. The Jerome was packed like you could not walk through there. And the stairs on either side were packed, and Hunter had the upstairs uh, suite as his campaign headquarters. And uh, it was nuts city. And, and we actually thought we were going to win there for a while. But when the votes came in from the Down Valley ranchers who were, who were still, you know, they were very conservative. Uh, they thought that people up in Aspen were crazy. And they, uh, you know, they swung the election back and he wound up losing by, I don't know, three or 400 votes, something yeah. like that. Uh, the one, one point I want to bring up is that <coughs> Joe um, started a movement by his campaign for mayor. And um, I, I think at the time, nobody knew the effects of what was going to happen then. But for Joe, his sort of stand in supporting the hippies and then his run for mayor, that inspired Hunter to run for sheriff. It inspired Tom Benton to make a political poster. And who would have known that all these experiences, you know, Tom Benton went on to make 75 political posters uh, throughout his career for all sorts of candidates that he supported. And then Hunter, of course, went on to, uh, you know, write a, a lot of famous books and become an icon. But the all of those interesting people all coalesced at that very unique time uh, in this building. And uh, I think it's a, a really special honor to have Joe here talking about uh, that experience and, and uh, his time here. Do you have any other uh, thoughts well, about yeah. Tom and, and Hunter? And well, I remember, you know, the, the, 
we, we, this was hard fought. I mean, this was not easy. Um, the sheriff hired an undercover agent to infiltrate Hunter's campaign headquarters and try to sell him a sawed-off shotgun to get him arrested. That's the kind of nuttiness that was going on. And he got outed by a, a city policeman who was friendly, who had, who had had his car towed and found the sawed-off shotgun and arrested the guy. And the sheriff calls him up and says, let that guy go. He's, my, he's working for me. And so that's the kind of energy and nuttiness that was going on. And, uh, and the business community felt threatened. Uh, they thought, even from back getting that petition up about hippies, uh, I mean, I, when, I, when I was elected a county commissioner in 72, um, Darcy Brown, the head of the ski corps, hired the, the county surveyor at that time, before I took office, I'd been elected but I hadn't taken office, to go out and measure the, the precinct lines and see if my house was really in the precinct one that I was running and had run as commissioner of. And uh, it turns out, and then they announced that I was living in the wrong precinct and I couldn't take office as a county commissioner. So you know, what it turned out is that I had a little cabin and I also had a barn for my horses. And uh, the line for the precinct ran right between them. And they thought the bigger building, the barn, was my house. So that's when they went public with uh, the statement that I couldn't take office. And then, you know, Dwight did a little cartoon where someone was instructing the counter surveyor on the difference between a horse and a commissioner. <laughs> <laughs> and, that, and the Aspen Times published that. Mm -hmm. but, but just from, you can see the kind of energy that this was not an easy battle. It wasn't a walkover. It was hard fought because a lot of people thought that these changes we were asking for and these controls we were asking for were going to imperil their livelihood. And um, of course, it didn't turn out to be the case for other reasons, but mm -hmm. um, it, was, it was an interesting time. I mean, we, w w the way the mall happened was two girls from Berkeley, one of whom was the daughter of the Lieutenant Governor Nancy Dick, uh, Margot Dick and Kathy Dukey, walked into my office and said, we, we think there ought to be a mall. And uh, how does that happen? And the city council was not interested in that. And so I prepared an initiative ordinance to close the streets. And, and they went out and got the signatures and forced the city to close the streets. It was either that or pay $60,000 for a special election, and they didn't have the money, didn't want to do that, so they agreed to try it out. Of course, it was a giant success. A lot of volunteers came in, they built railroad tie planters to block the street, and it took off from there, and was a great success. Uh, you know, we opposed the Olympics successfully. They wanted to do the downhill here in 76, because we, they wanted to build a Soviet-style apartment blocks out where the golf course is mm -hmm. to house the, uh, you know, the participants. And we knew that would be a growth generator and a big development uh, thing. And Benton, Benton did a poster for that campaign, and it says, No Olympics Stop the Final Rape of Aspen. Uh, can you talk a little bit about Aspen today and how it relates to maybe the battles that you were waging then? Well, I left office, I was in office for eight years. I left in 81. And <clears throat> if you drive up from, from Basalt, the development that you can see from your car as you drive up was almost all of approved when I took office. And when I took office, we denied two hotels at Buttermilk, uh, several condominium projects that were strung out along the highway between the town boundaries then and, and Buttermilk. And uh, in 74, changed the zoning, which had been, uh, would have allowed a density of about a half a million people between Aspen and Snowmass at Aspen. 
It was 55 units an acre allowed by right. Developer could buy the land, walk in, buy right, get a building permit to build it, almost anything he wanted. So we changed that zoning to one unit per 10 acres. And, most of, and the rest of the county beyond Rush Creek wasn't zoned at all. So we zoned the whole rest of the county and, uh, and put it at very low density. And most of the development that has occurred since, I didn't approve, I don't think, a single subdivision in the eight years I was in office. We just turned them all down. So it went from, you can do whatever you want and rape Aspen to you can't do anything. And uh, the development that did happen happened at a density of one unit per 35 acres because that's exempt by state law from our ability to regulate it. So that pretty much uh, held, I mean, we turned down Wildcat, 31,000 people, we turned down George Mitchell from Houston. He did the, the, the woodlands north of Houston, big developer, who bought Owl Creek, the whole of Owl Creek. He wanted to put another snowmass at Aspen there with ski area coming down that, that side of, of, uh, of Burnt Mountain and, uh, you know, against the base condos like they have at Snowmass and a big residential development. We turned him down. That developed at one unit for 35 acres because that was exempt. Uh, we turned down a ski area on the east side of town and condominiums out on the North Star Nature Preserve. We uh, wound up buying the North Star property and turning it into the Nature Preserve, but there was proposals by Jimmy Smith for uh, hundreds of condos there. Uh, we turned down the Little Annie ski area. So if you think Aspen's a little crowded right now, just imagine what it would be like if we hadn't. It would be nuts. And uh, I think we successfully saved the physical space. Now, I, I think the city has made some serious mistakes by not, uh, you know, I think their infill project was a, was a mistake. And, uh, you know, allowing tall buildings, I think, is a mistake. Penthouses. Penthouses on top. You know, what happened is um, the nicer we made Aspen, we built a lot of bike trails. That was my pet program. Every year I was in office, we spilled at least a quarter of a million dollars on trails. Um, Dwight created, my co-commissioner co created the bus system. We bought some old school buses and started running them and eventually it became RAFTA, which is now the second largest transit system in the state of Colorado. And, uh, you know, we tried to get in a light rail system, which was going to go along the, the Midland right away and around Shadow Mountain and pick up, pick up highlands and cross over to Buttermilk and around the base of Buttermilk out to Snowmass. But, uh, you know, that, that never flew. And we were also trying to create a uh, an auto-free community by having an intercept lot like, um, you know, some of the Swiss villages where you get out of your car and you get into town by public transit. But we ran into a lot of people didn't want to not have their car right there. So that didn't, that didn't ever happen. But we, we did a lot of what I think were good things. But the, the irony was that um, the nicer we made the place, the more attractive it got to be for second homes. And, you know, while Dwight and I had an inkling back in the 70s that that was a problem that was causing uh, prices to go up and, and the residents to be bought out of the town, which is why we created the affordable housing program. I mean, we bought a mining claim, we hired a contractor, we built these houses, the condos rather, and we sold them to people who had lived here and worked here for at least two years with the requirement that they sell it back through the housing authority at no greater than a 3% appreciation, which is what they could get out of a savings account, so that they, the, the, the housing would remain in a pool available for, for employees. And uh, that now has expanded, uh, there's almost 3,000 units now. 
uh, both rental and purchase. And if those units weren't here, this place would look like Telluride's Mountain Village does in the off season, just dead. Yeah. There's nobody there at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the way this would look because 65% of our homes are now owned by second homeowners who don't live here. And that has pushed out that eclectic, egalitarian, wild, crazy, fun-filled group of people who I first saw when I came to town. And the first 10, 20 years I was here, it was still like that. It's not like that anymore. I mean, it was wild and woolly. It was a lot of fun. There was a lot of drugs. There was a lot of fun. There was a lot of play. There was skinny dipping everywhere. Uh, <laughs> It was, uh, it was a party, and uh, it was kind of like I thought, man, this is how life ought to be uh -huh. for the whole world. Mm -hmm. It was really great. Is, is, is there anything, um, sort of wrap up about, you know, the Tom Benton and Hunter and that whole era, any sort of lasting thoughts on the legacy of, of what, you know, you were a part of? Well, you know, what, Hunter, what Hunter's thing did was change policing. Uh, he didn't win, but w when I was a commissioner, uh, Sheriff Whitmire's uh, undersheriff was ordered by the district judge to be removed from office because of prisoner abuse. It was that bad. So the district attorney had to file suit against the sheriff's office to get a judge to order him to get this guy out of, out of the way. As a result of all the confrontation about that, Sheriff Whitmire resigned. Well, Dwight and I were commissioners. We appointed uh, as his replacement, Dick Keenis, who was to be Hunter's under sheriff if Hunter had won. Dick, Harris, Dick Keenis was a policeman here in Aspen who resigned from the department over the way they were mistreating the hippies. And he was a very enlightened guy, Dick Keenis. And he had been, he'd been to seminary. He trained to be a priest. He wasn't ever, but he, they called him Dick Dove and his deputies of love. <laughs> and he had, uh, you can get a picture of him. While you're still here, before you leave, go in the bathroom and notice how cool it looks. There's, that's the way this whole building looked. The only remnant of the way Tom built it is in the bathroom. It's very Japanesey, and uh, it, it really is cool. But in there, there's a picture on one wall of Whitmire and his deputies holding their shotguns and their carbines, and on the other wall is Dick Dove and his deputies of love. And it looks like a bunch of hippies over there. Mm -hmm. And they they didn't carry guns. They wore blue jeans and green shirts. They did not have a military presence. And it changed the whole policing from, you know, what do you got in your pocket to uh, what can I do for you? Community service oriented, how can, how can we help you? And it has remained that way for 30 years. Mm -hmm. And Dick Keenis pledged not to ever use informants or undercover agents to try to enforce the drug laws. I mean, if you were stupid enough to, you know, used it in public, you got arrested. But there wasn't any aggressive campaign to try to arrest people for smoking dope, which, which had existed previously. And, and it's very difficult to enforce victimless crimes where you got a willing buyer and a willing seller, unless you got some sneaky informant or undercover agent, because the buyer and seller, they ain't gonna tell anybody. <laughs> so, you know, I, 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 think, I, think, I think Hunter's activities and Benton's activities and the conspiracies hatched on the floor above us really softened and changed the whole attitude of the town. And, and it's remained that way for decades. And, uh, and as to, you know, in hindsight, there are other things we could have and should have done to try to, you know, keep some control and handle on the fact that we now have 65% of our homes empty most of the time and displace the people who work here 
downtown. And, and you know, the irony, another irony is that the, the second homeowners who came here, they didn't want to change the town. They just saw, hey, this is really cool. Like the same experience I had when I came the first time. And I want to I wanna be here. But they came in such numbers and with such uh, external wealth that it really did create another uh, divide in the community now. And you can feel it. And there's a difference between uh, the people on Red Mountain with the Gulf Star or Gulf Stream Jets and the people that are, you know, bringing them flowers or massages or whatever. So I think that was unfortunate that it happened to the degree that it did. Uh, but it did. And uh, it's still a pretty nice place to live. Well, with, with that, I want to thank you, Joe, for coming in and sharing your story. Uh, and, and if anybody has any questions yeah. about, you know, mm -hmm. what we did or what Hunter said or mm -hmm. whatever, I'll be glad to. Okay, cool. And we're also going to encourage anyone. Um, well, with that, we're going to end the Second Liberty Salon. We want to thank the Aspen Historical Society for coming in. And we're going to open up the mic. Uh, I think there's a couple people out there that have, you know, a short story, interesting thing to say about Tom. You're welcome to come up. Uh, if not, that's cool. I want to thank everyone for coming and uh, have a nice evening. Hey, girl, I'm gonna... That's my husband, David, who I can't see. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. We're going give, to give her the mic. First of all, Tom married. story is very brief. It's how I met Tom. I came here in 1969 from New York. I didn't know a soul. My parents did have a home here and had been coming here since the early 50s. But they wouldn't let me stay in their home. So I came out here in a VW bus. I stayed in what is the Floridora. It was like a rooming house then. I brought with me a bunch of hash, and I didn't know what to do with it. Don't forget, this is 1969. Uh, and I had it in two big paper bags with handles on it. And I decided I'd walk through town, and I didn't want to leave it in this rooming house. So I brought it with me. And, <laughs> and I walked by Tom's place. Didn't, it looked interesting from the outside. And I walked in. And he said something like, that smells good. And, and I said, what are you talking about? And of course, I'm sitting there with these two huge bags filled with what was called black opiated hash. And that was how our friendship started. <laughs> Need I say more? I, I also, for a brief time, worked on his campaign. Uh, I was good friends with Ned Vera and Hunter Thompson. And I believe I introduced my cousin to Hunter who got him working for the Rolling Stone. And we all have a connection, and that's it. And I'm glad to be here. You did a wonderful, wonderful thing, by the way. You did. You described everything perfectly.